My first job in the media was actually in radio. I did work experience at KISS FM when I was 16. Um, and it was a year that KISS first became legal. So it was amazing because it was sort of half legal and half not, <laughs> though it was actually legal. Um, but it was such a great time to be there. It was like the sound of young London, all the big sort of DJs that you know now and all the big names in music started there. So as a 16 year old, I had this amazing access to some of the sort of the best people in the business who fortunately have, you know, are still good friends of mine. So yeah, it was a great place to start. I've always been interested in politics for a number of reasons. Um, I grew up in a very working class area. I grew up in Walthamstow, East London, though it's not working class anymore. <laughs> like, it's like so gentrified. I can't recognise it every time I go back. Um, but I saw firsthand um, growing up the importance of um, uh, social mobility. You know, I was very lucky. I had aspirational parents who wanted the best for us. Um, not all my friends at my school had the same. But what was very interesting about my school was it was one of the best in the area. So you had the local kids like myself from the council estate, but then you had um, the kind of sort of middle class, um, upwardly mobile families that didn't want to send their kids to private school, who sent their kids to our school. And they were all on the sort of the, the parents association. So our school got all the kind of the good perks. But it was a really good um, example of the haves and the haves nots. And not about ability, really, it was just about sort of um, who was fortunate enough to, to have a family that expected more from them because the school itself was actually decent. But the kind of system around you had a really big part to play as well. So for me, that's always been my passion in how you sort of level the playing field and, and how you use politics for what it's for. So the reason I sort of decided to move to America was for a number of reasons. Um, I had, uh, I was very lucky, you know, I, I sort of had a good run in this country um, and was in a position where I was able to do lots of different types of jobs, you know, which is quite rare for a young presenter in the sense that I could still do the sort of the pop interview, you know, with a you know, a Beyonce or whatever. Um, but then, you know, I was still lucky enough to be able to interview the Prime Minister. So that in itself was quite rare. So I thought, well, I have this kind of good platform that, fingers crossed, I hope if it doesn't work out over there, I can come back to. And I just wanted to almost be scared again. And I think, you know, for anybody who's been in a job for a while, um, even if the job is good, the minute you get comfortable, I, I like the idea of sort of, you know, testing yourself and seeing what else you can do. Um, and so I was lucky, I moved to the States, um, I had a job more or less straight away, but it was very different, you know, it was like starting all over again, but the nice thing was to start all over again with experience, as opposed to starting all over again in a nervous wreck. Um, and what I found uh, uh, really helpful, and I'm so glad I did it, was two things. It definitely, definitely helped in terms of my confidence, because you know, when they say, you know, when they talk about that American can-do approach, it's real. You know, when you go there, if you have an idea, someone's going to give you a chance. And I don't necessarily know if it's, it's exactly the same here. I think we still have a way to go on those things. But in America, we, uh, my friend and I came up with the idea for a women's conference. Uh, we had never done an event before. And our first event, Sarah Brown, Ariana Huffington and Donna Karen came on board. <laughs> Only in America. That would never happen here. Um, and so it was lovely. You know, I was able to meet lots of people. Um, I definitely uh, uh, was able to present some really cool, exciting shows, but also develop the more business side of myself, um, which was nice. Um, and also understand the corporate world just because from doing the women's conference, it meant that I had liaised with a lot of women, high-powered women in the corporate world. Um, so, yeah, I'm really glad I went, but it was time to come home. Uh, it was a, a British trifle that brought me back. <laughs> they don't have trifle in America. Um, and I've been eating lots of it since I've been back. <laughs> I 
The standout moment for me in terms of presenting for sure was Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday party. Um, it was such an honour to be asked. Um, I had done some work with um, him and his foundation and over the years um, and you never think they're actually going to say, oh, June, would you present his birthday party? You're like, sure. Oh, and Will Smith's doing it. Sure. <laughs> And it was actually one of, um, I think it was one of Amy Winehouse's final gigs. And I remember, you know, what was so amazing about that event was we had the most phenomenal lineup. Everybody turns up for Nelson Mandela, especially when he's 90. Um, and um, it was brilliant, you know, it was Hyde Park, people, and the weather was good as well. The weather held up that day. And a Amy was the final act, and no one knew if she was actually going to turn up. And so, she was, she finally did arrive and, you know, it was really interesting to see because it was the beginning of when you could see things sort of unravel. But somehow she still put on this amazing performance. Like, amazing, that's how magical that evening was. Everybody sort of gave their best to make his birthday special. So, yeah, it was wonderful. Um, other people I've interviewed over the years that I've loved, you know, I did one of Beyonce's first ever British interviews. I'd been interviewing them since they were 16. Um, and, you know, the thing with this job is when you interview people throughout their career, especially if you get them at the beginning, you sort of get to know them. And I remember the funniest thing with her um, was, I can't remember who it was, it was a British might have been Jonathan Ross or someone who at the time had signed a big television deal and the deal was a three million pound deal and we were all in the dressing room because we, we were about to do an interview and so she, we're looking through the um, magazine and she's like oh my god a three million pound deal that's like five million dollars and I was like yeah she's like oh my god dad can you imagine if we we're ever worth that much and so whenever I see her I'm like how's that five million <laughs> you know it's just lovely to see you know that progression and she's still the sweetest nicest unaffected um star there is we uh women inspiration enterprise uh, was founded yep 2010 in new york uh and it was as a result of a dinner and as I was saying before, the, it's, it's, it, this could only have happened in the States in this way. So Sarah Brown, um, I had just moved uh, to uh, America and over the years I'd interviewed her husband and so I'd gotten to know her a bit. And so she uh, invited me to a, a dinner which was called the Important Dinner for Women. So obviously, as a woman, when you get that invite, you're like, I better go, it's important. So anyway, so I went to this dinner and, you know, doing the job that I do, you meet so many big names. It's rare to get intimidated just because you just get used to it. But I was completely intimidated in that room. I was a nervous wreck. Everyone you could imagine from Nicole Kidman, Hillary Clinton, uh, Queen Rania, Diane, it was ridiculous, ridiculous, only in that American way. And um, Martha Stewart, I mean, and so anyway, so I said to Sarah, I said, you know, this is amazing, but the problem here is all these women are at the top of their game and they don't necessarily have anything to teach each other. What we need is something for the next generation so that these women can sort of impart their wisdom and knowledge onto the ones that are coming after them. So she was like, okay, great. So anyway, so we ended up standing up in front of this whole scary room saying we were going to do an event. Never done an event before in our lives. <laughs> and then it meant that we only had three months to put it on because to get the caliber of speakers that we wanted, we needed to do the event during UN week because everybody's in New York at that time. Um, and so we... Uh, somehow pulled it off and got some amazing names for our first one um, and now you know in America it's sort of become the market leader in that space over there um, and we uh, are here uh, in a smaller capacity here um, and also in Africa so yeah it kind of worked out okay in the end <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, I do um, keynotes. Uh, really, the thing that I'm sort of passionate about is um, uh, diversity. And by that, um, I mean in the broad sense, um, obviously from a perspective of whether it be the BAME community, uh, gender, um, but also disability. You know, I think it's, you know, going forward, we have to figure out a way to get corporations to think um, and actually really see the benefits of having a diverse wor workforce. And not just at a low or mid level, but also at the senior level too. Um, as the data shows, it's better for the bottom line. Um, it's better all round just because you have a different perspective in the room. Um, so yeah, for me, uh, that's the stuff that I really love to talk about.